que nos das de estar en tu casa de oración, Señor. Pedimos que sea tu mano poderosa, Señor. Tomando toda perturbación, Señor, del control. Toda distracción, todo aquello, Señor, que no ayuda cuando se predica, Señor. Padre, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús, ayuda, Señor, a cada uno, aún de los padres, Señor, a responsabilizarse, Señor, a ayudar en lo que pueden, Señor. palabra, Señor, como debe de darse, mi Señor, en el nombre de Jesús. Sea tu presencia, Señor, tomando control de nuestras mentes, de nuestro corazón. Señor, todo aquel plan diabólico, Señor, ya trazado, Señor, sea deshecho en el nombre de Jesús para que tu palabra corra, Señor, y nos siga siendo libres y siga siendo, Señor, lo que tú la mandas a hacer en nuestros corazones, Padre. Atamos y reprendemos todo el espíritu, Señor, inmundo, descarado, Señor, todo espíritu inmundo, Señor, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Toma control, Señor. Yo creo que tú tienes poder. Yo creo, Señor, que aún tu palabra lo que dice, que no se levantará el limpio en la congregación de los justos, Señor. En el nombre de Jesús, que seas tu Señor hablando. Porque en realidad la única que nos ha limpiado es tu palabra, Señor. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Gracias, Señor. Da paz, da descanso por toda carga, toda preocupación, Señor. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Gracias, Señor. Amén. Pueden sentarse, mis hermanos. Apocalipsis 2, del 18 en adelante, pero estamos en las áreas de... El problema que él tenía contra la iglesia de Teatira es que toleraban The church of Thyatira was that they tolerated the spirit of Jezebel and Matilat. What have we tolerated? Saying that we're Christian. Saying that we do love God. Saying all these things. What is it that we're not supposed to tolerate? And I told you also, and I love this, let us speak. To those who want to serve God, I know that There's people that this really upsets. Maybe you should notice that you're not right with the Lord because this is the, right of the word of God. The day that I speak to you, whatever I want to speak to you, or whatever I please talk about, run out. We're on the part of discovering the roots. And you know you're familiarized, those of you who are reading the Bible in Numbers chapter 16, where it talks, where they talk about that, that plot against Moses and Aaron. And it wasn't just any kind of person. They were princes. How tremendous. They get up against him and they say, not just God speaks through you, he also uses us too. That's where we started to see the rebellion was something that tormented people. When rebellion doesn't leave our lives, when it's not removed from our lives, it's such a big problem. There we are stubborn and we say stiff-necked, you know, what I want to do, we're going to do. If we were all in that mentality, that fire when they showed you that there was gas, gasoline, there was petrol, petrol. There's so many things, and I understood when God took us to speak about the temperaments, what the Lord was speaking about. There could be so much friction that this place can be closed to that extent, if it were that way. That we don't come to worship one God, have one faith, not believe what we want to believe, no, but the Bible has taught us how to believe. And it's shown us how to worship God. The Bible has taught us how we're supposed to unite in one spirit to be able to worship God. If not, this would be a complete disaster. Everyone would have their own stubbornness, their own way of thinking. All of us, we have that, we could say, because I myself, God continues working in my life. But when it's one Lord, one faith, one spirit, we can't do whatever we please to do. We do what pleases Him because he is the one we've received into our hearts and that is the great difference if not then here we'd have the hair flying not because of the holy spirit but because someone's pulling someone else's hair so 
May God always liberate us. But then one of the things that some of the things that we have spoken because we're talking about bitterness. How many bitter people are here today? <laughs> Haven't you noticed that sometimes we tolerate some things and we just leave them there? Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking carefully, so be vigilant, your own life. Leave everyone else alone because sometimes we are pointing over there and look at all the fingers pointing back at you. This one doesn't point that way or this way, but this that way and three are pointing back at you. How odd. But I'm sure that God thought about all of this. Because he knows, he knows what he was creating. So it says, looking carefully, lest if anyone falls short of the grace of God, if any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Why have people been so damaged within the congregation because of gossip, because of false witness from bitter people? Colossians 3, 8 to 9. The Apostle Paul to the Colossians, it says, but now, right now, in this very moment, when God is speaking to us about something, it's right now, filthy garment, it says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, that, that white clothing that the Lord put on us, we need to keep it cleaning it and cleaning it. Says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Anger. These are the faces of bitterness. Anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Not others' mouths. Your own. It says your mouth. It's your mouth. And it says in 9, do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. This is why God had the great idea for us to be baptized, because that's what it means that when we are submerged, that all the sins are left there for dead. That's why I love in the old times when they would baptize in rivers. And now we can't. We can't do that no more because now there's just water that stays still. But when they would do it in rivers, that's what it represented because the water would flow and the sins would wash away. We thought that it's wrath, anger, malice, blasphemy, dishonest words. And up until that's the part that we're getting at. What did we say that dishonest words were in our mouth? And there is the original word. They're shameful words, hurtful words, vile words, low words, dishonest words, ugly words, unworthy words, infamous words, dishonorable. Do we move on? I've seen conversations, rude comments, double meaning jokes, crude language, rude, inconvenient, gross insults, any low expression coming from an uncontrolled tongue can be translated also as abuse, misspoken abuse. This is from the original dictionary where the dishonest words were taken out of, where we got the, the meaning of it, I'm sorry. So we continue. This expression is referring to unpleasing words full of despise, arrogance, whose purpose is to hurt and damage someone. I always said that when someone gets close to you and said that I said that I did, come with me. Because the gossiper, they hear something that they misunderstood. But I asked you if you wanted to know what was the tongue that the Lord. Look at one of the verses that we ended on the week before last. It was this one, Proverbs 20, 20. There is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. 
We're going to study the tongue. How can we know what beauty there is and God that what beauty is there that God sees in us? And I found something that shocked me. And I'm going to show it to you in a bit. The importance of a beautiful tongue. I'm going to ask the question, is your tongue beautiful? And we're going to study because it says dishonest words and then we're going to follow into the lies what we have tolerated. Says, I have a few things against you that you tolerate, Jezebel. Who me, you could say. But when we don't control our tongue, we are tolerating because it's not something that pleases God. If you were to look and see how many Bible verses there are referencing the tongue, you would be so afraid. There's so many. And it speaks such important things in the Vamos word about it. Let us see the importance for God for a beautiful tongue. So I ask you the question right now and you answer yourself, is your tongue beautiful? I found a really beautiful verse in the Song of Solomon. And where it's highlighted is what I want to say. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. It always makes me laugh when it says. And thy speech is coming. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. This is somebody who had to, he had to be like someone from the farm or something like that because he loved seeing his garden and his fruits and vegetables and animals and that's how he makes his romantic speeches to the Lord. So it says, and thy speech is comely, it's beautiful. What is true beauty before God? I've always noticed that there's more, that there's more vanity in men than women. I know that there's some, some men that are way more than some women. But if you notice, the Bible says, a man of truth who is to find her. And it says, a woman of truth who will find her. Why does it ask us that question? Of course, some of us say that we're Christian, but in reality, truthfully, is it true? This is so important. We don't come to this place where before we were taught that because of what you paid, because of what you did, you gained heaven. That's a lie from the devil. If we don't accept Jesus and he cleanses our heart, then we're not going to go to heaven because he is the ticket to get to heaven, no one else. We should do good deeds because he is good, and of course, because he is in us, we do good deeds. But look at what it says. What is true beauty before God is what we're asking. So let's just show you what the Bible says. Proverbs 11.22 says, As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. What is it good for people when they say that they look like this or that? What is it good for? A woman, without, a woman who lacks discretion, someone who lacks reason. Ask a man who's married to a woman like this and see how happy he actually is. Of course, if you ask him, don't ask him in front of his wife. He might be dishonest. Right then and there, she might beat him. So be uh, wise. But ask. There's men who have told me living with this woman is a living hell. Hell. And I tell them, well, hurry up and serve God because the hell down there is worse than the one you're living right now. And it's true. If right here you don't 
don't have peace or rest over there, much less. So make sure, be sure that you are holding on to God. Otherwise, you're going to suffer so much more than you can imagine. And sometimes people say, no, tell me, no. Look, beauty for God, is it the body? Is it for a woman to be curvy and have a thin waistline? And it makes it very clear, like a ring of gold in a swine's snout. That's how God sees it. That's why a wise woman edifies her home. And if you don't understand, as a woman, go into the book of Proverbs, into the last chapter. And when you find, see yourself in a mirror, that means that we are becoming more and more like our Lord. Why break our heads? Simple. Oh, I'm skinny. And those fat people. What good is it for you to be thin if you're lacking discretion? Truthfully. This is really sad. But this is the true beauty that God is seeking. It's not this. Solomon says that you speak, the way she speaks is so beautiful. There's people that trap you just because of their words, because they have love, because they have something to give. But some, I'm telling you, run for your life, I would say. If we were to speak about the tongue, maybe we've never considered it in terms of attractiveness or of beauty. Or I ask you, when you go to the mirror and you see yourself and you get ready, or are you like this? Until we wash our face, we notice, but I'm not there in the mirror to see my tongue and see how beautiful it looks and how perfect it is. When have you ever seen in beauty books the, the most beautiful tongue in the world, right? Maybe they'll talk about the most white and shiny teeth, but of the tongue, it's not prominent on vanity magazines, right? Vain, vain magazines. Maybe we don't see it every day in the mirror. The tongue, more than the shape of your face or the dimensions of your figure, the abundance of variety of your clothes, determines if you are a beautiful person or not. And I say this from my own person. Does God want us better? Of course he does. That's why he's speaking to us about these messages. So, that's the tongue. It's not the body. It's not the clothes. None of these things is not the tongue. We're talking about the beauty standard of the Bible. What pleases the Lord? That's why we came into this topic. The King Solomon was no Puritan in his declarations and judgments um, according to Bible. Nevertheless, in his beautiful poem, Song Solomon, he renders tribute to the beauty of the tongue, saying in the verse that we saw that, that her speech was beautiful. Like scarlet, right? Is what it said, right? Because they're red. That's what he's referring to. Referring to. The tongue can make any person, any ordinary person. The tongue can make any ordinary person a beautiful person. The tongue can cure wounds and scars. The tongue can soften agitated temperaments. And this is like when you see someone who's super angry and then you start to speak to them softly with love. And it's almost like they're embarrassed and they realize, they come to reason. The tongue can give hope to the forsaken soul or the discouraged soul. The can signal the path to God. And we talked about how beautiful are those feet of those who go on the mountains preaching the gospel. 
La Biblia la compara al the timón Bible de un barco. Is compared to the the yeah, the steering wheel of a boat. No sé si a ustedes les ha tocado, mis hermanos, pero a mí me ha tocado ver barcos grandes. I've seen huge con, boats. Con un timón, es como se le llama el barco, mi hermano. Wheel. Una un volante podríamos yeah, decir, ¿verdad? Like Chiquito. Wheel. Small. ¿Qué es esto? So small, and you say, This is what takes us to wherever we need to go. This is what took that boat that no one was going to supposedly drown. It was the tongue that was the problem. So James 3 4 says, Look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot desires. The Bible also compares it to the fire that with a small spark it can create a huge fire. Is this, this is man and women separated from reason. They have the beauty and they think that they're like the soda and Fanta commercial. But notice it can create a huge fire, just a tiny spark. You know that the majority of fires in California is one of them that is always burning. Sometimes it's someone who just throws a cigarette out the window or around there. And look at what all of that has caused, burning houses and people and everything. And this is how the Bible compares it, and this is where it says in James 3.5. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. So see how a forest, see how great a forest, a little fire kindles. The tongue can break a marriage. So don't be a gossiper wherever no one has called you. It can make your home a paradise or a hell. Let me just tell you, many parents don't understand this. They have come to Christ, they have years saying that they know God, and still to this day their home is not a home of rest, of covering for the children. Do you know what peace of mind I had when I would see my kids would come home from school, they would even slam the door at times, and I said it wasn't a good day. They would go into the room, they would rest, and I would never go, don't you ever slam my door on your mom, no. The room that we give them in, in our homes that has a door is for their own privacy. That man would say, let them just cool off, they're upset, just speak wisely. What happened? I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. What happened? I don't want to talk. So I would go and I would pray. And what does God do? He gives rest in our home. If the husband and wife don't do this, then they haven't truly known God because they have to enjoy something that has to appear like heaven or be similar. To get home and fighting and shut up and this and that. And to the room, they close the door and they lock themselves in. As a Christian parent, as a Christian mother, you can make your home. I always tell them, if we have problems, let us go into our room and there we can resolve them. There's where I would beat him severely. No, she's joking. And I'd hit him where you couldn't see the scars. He always said that I would hit him where nobody would be able to see evidence. 
that would talk like children of God with, with not dishonest vile words, but with words from a mouth that Jesus Christ has washed and cleansed. This is what's so beautiful. If you have not taken advantage of this, then I invite you to allow Jesus Christ to come again and recognize you as Lord and Savior and allow him to do something in your life so that he can, you can stop making that place a hell. It can bring affection from your children or separate them with, from you with, to the point where they unlike you. What is it that you say to your children? I've always been careful of the things that children complain about because sometimes also children don't like to be governed, so they talk really bad about their parents. So I always try to find a good balance when people open up to me when teenagers have come to me to kind of talk about their parents. I can give them advice and tell them what's but sometimes I know that not everything that they're telling me is true because they tell them to clean and that's why they're super angry and you're mad with mom and dad. Well, I mean, it's understandable that you're angry and they're going to talk so bad. They're going to say they mistreat me and no one even says anything to them. So I've known cases like that, but if you leave this place and you start talking about the church and talking about people, if the children have nothing with God, or want any relationship with God, why could that be? Because of your own mouth and praise them if you can. It's your tongue and no, someone's it's stone. It's not the devil. The devil has not even gotten involved at all, but your own tongue without control has not allowed salvation to come to your family. Friends or lose them. You can defend a good cause or make a bad cause be triumphant. How many of you think that they were there when, how many people do you think were there when Hitler was reigning? What do you think involved all these people to, to come on his side because of his tongue? And we thank God for Jesus Christ because he is the only one who has ever come to break through all races. And that's why when I, when I meet Christians and they're racist, I question their their salvation. If it was Christ who created us, some he put our color, and some he's bronze, and some he made it perfect. And then sometimes I see that people are very dark, and with Afro Americans, they're racist. But your skin ain't even white to begin with yourself. So I say they ain't right in their head. That's what I'm tell you that. Because Jesus Christ was the only one. Because look, when Paul preaches, he speaks, and he talks to the slaves, and he speaks to the masters. There was still slavery, but as our time that has diminished and diminished and diminished, and why? Because the masters started to convert to Jesus Christ, and that started to change. If you were to know history well of slavery, when they started to liberate many of our beloved brothers, there was a lot of white people helping the cause as well. But you keep on with racism, your ungrateful, disgusting tongue towards the one who created us all. There's nothing else to say. And praise him if you can. Amen. This is really sad. You can lift up a church or you can kill one. You can attract people to Christ or separate them from him. You can honor God or curse God. You can save suicidal people or it can push people to their own destruction. When we spoke about the temperaments, I was so pleased, you already know, with the choleric temperament, dangerous temperament, the extrovert, whatever their mouth is filled with, they express it with everything, and the phlegmatic, the melancholy person, they're more reserved, they're introverts. When we would see that class, I learned many things the blessing that God had given me to teach, but I received at the same time. When the choleric or the sanguine 
Mary's the person that has suffered so much with what they have lived, the melancholy and the phlegmatic one who's a, a feet dragger. You know, they don't want to leave no one behind. But those in the front, they're also pushing people and pulling them. So it's such a blessing, regardless of what temperament you have. It's a great blessing that God gives us. But if you notice, people, as soon as somebody starts, oh, I want to take my life, here's the knife. Do it. There's people that like to manipulate, and there's people that are really tormented by an, an evil spirit. And that's such a great difference. If that person were to take their life, actually, what would you do? That would be your thought as well for also kind of pushing them to do it so just shut up if you have nothing good to say because if they actually end up taking their life their blood is on your hands as well and i know there's people that have tried to manipulate with suicide and pretend those people who faint <laughs> so y'all can learn when you faint look that was a, that happened a lot in my childhood and on my day to day life as soon as I felt like something fell on me I would just fall I didn't even have a moment to sit or grab onto anything it just, you just get the feeling immediately so when I see people there I'm fainting I'm fainting I'm fainting I say alright I start watching the show to see how See if it's better than the soap operas they show on the TV. <laughs> May God help us. Look at what the Bible says. The importance of a good tongue. Proverbs 18.21, the piece of advice that is given to us because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Yeah. Amy was saying it made us laugh. Yeah. I don't care to die. I don't care to die. I'm not afraid of death. But when death is surrounding us, we are like, pray for me, please help me. You know, so we don't want to go. Here, we're going to speak a little bit more profound. Your reputation will be established in great part with the use you have of your tongue. It will leave a permanent impression on people that surround you. It will mark like a tag. It will mark your own character like a tag, like a label. And do you see why God calls us to be like children? Have you seen Elijah, what he always asks for prayer? A kid? No, I'm a Christian. How? What would they think of me? Let people think whatever they want. That is my fight. That is my battle. Please, brothers, I need help. I need showers of prayers over my life because my temperament, I cannot dominate it. What a great difference would it be in our own lives if we were open. And Elijah said, thank you for praying. He had realized we were praying because he hadn't struggled. And I said, what if he would have struggled? He would have said, okay, y'all didn't pray for me, so what's going on? <laughs> Very sincere. So during the process of judgment of Jesus, those people who were close said more than they e understood themselves when they declared Peter, right? He was hiding so no one would see him there and says that he even started saying words he shouldn't be saying, but look, 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 when someone is marked by God, someone who truthfully has chosen to follow God in their immature ways of thinking, look at what it says in Matthew 26, 73. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. It, it uncovers you. God changed Peter's mouth. Yes, Lord. Yes, sir, he, it did. There were still areas he was struggling, but he did not speak how he used to speak before knowing Jesus Christ. He 
He was a good Esa fighter. Causa, pero que caused, que eran but los celotes. Look up what. Celotes con Z, no the zealots. Celotes zealots celoso, were the zealots. <laughs> look up that cause. He was part Busque of that group hermano. of the zealots. Le dejó de tarea, busque, I'm going to leave you that, that homework. Para que usted un so you can even see what Aunque great things God did with him, hermano, even if, que, que even they didn't want him to discover that he was with Jesus and he hid and he started to say things he shouldn't. But they said, you are one of them for your speech betrays you. The way you speak discovers you. Why is there people that talk about other people and they say, that person isn't Christian. He's dirty because he's this, because he's that. Only why? Because their speech isn't of a Christian. And that's the beauty that God is seeking within us as children of him. For people to be able to notice that we had an encounter. And I'm going to tell you, this is the great thing about sanctification. When someone says, I am in Christ and he is in me, as John says, in, in the book of John, you know what he's trying to say, that while he is in us and us in him, sanctification is flowing. There's a great shining of rain over us, and that's what it changes the way we speak. Because sanctification, what it does is that it makes us hate all of that that does not please God. And I'm not talking about humans. It makes us hate the sin. That's where you really notice if there is sanctification in, in your mouth, in your speech. If we were to be able to understand Peter's even person, so that they wouldn't believe that he was with him. Read the Bible, that's what it says. And they say, no, you're one of them. You're one of them. Because your speech betrays you. No matter how much he wanted to hide, you know what there was? There was, there was immaturity in Peter. Because after they see that he matures and truthfully knows his Savior, to the magnitude that he even laid his life down for the gospel and they were going to crucify him he asked to be crucified upside down in your way of speech are you bitter or sweet what a great difference to our children if our kids come towards us and we say what happened my love what's up baby <laughs> come and we yell what do you want yeah, yeah well, there's Christ all over you that's for sure who knows why we ran away from those people have we tolerated? Yes, we have. And it starts here. The word of God has straightened me. That's why for me, before it hurt me, it would bother me, it was harsh. Now I receive it all, but the sanctification is really getting into our lives through that encounter. If Christ abides in us and we abide in him, then sanctification should be a given. It should happen. And the cause that happened is that we hate what does not please the Lord. We hate that vile, that vile prude way of speaking. Tell me the contrary. That's what the word says. It could be that the people that don't live in our home, we treat very well. But with the people that live in our home, let's start there. Our husband, our wife, and our children. How do you treat your children? First, learn to live by what God says, and then we can speak when your life truthfully is in the hand of God, and He, Jesus Christ, is in you. 
as it says in the, the book of John, where Jesus Christ is speaking to abides in me, speaking about the true vine and me in him, this one will give many fruit. Why don't we see the fruit? Sometimes because of laziness, because we don't give too much attention to what we should. We're more worried about gossip than preparing ourselves in this beauty salon that we call the Bible. Because there's priorities. I care more about everything else than my own life. But it says now, today, right? From this point forward, your time needs to be different. Leaving the old man behind, bury him as, as deep as you possibly can. So let us admit, so how do you treat your wife? How do you treat your husband? I know that there are times, and I say this joking, I do respect my husband. There are times that I have said, let me just, let me just turn him by the neck a little bit. A little, a little tight, just a little bit. Just maybe tightening this finger more. <laughs> because there's things that we just make us go crazy as humans. And problems with couples. One time there was such a huge problem. They already had divorce on the table. Why? Because the husband would not put the toilet seat down. I thought it was just so simple, just put it down. But for her, no. She said, I'm done. And these were people who claimed they knew Christ. I told them and told them and told them. Sometimes we forget that everything that God allows to come close to us is to mold us. Whether it be temptation, trial, illness, it's to form us, it's to mold us, shape us. When the moment comes, and I'm going to speak to you very honestly, when I see that my husband as a cazador starts to focus on things he's doing, and it's like, I'm all the way over here. If I cry, yes. But you know what the Holy Spirit has brought to me? I've wanted to spend time with you and you've done the same to me. You've had priorities. And I said, blessed be the Lord. The anger goes away and, and I don't know why. <laughs> yes, because I understand that if he has mercy with me, I have to have mercy with my husband as well. That's why I say all of it. And Romans says, 8.28, that we know that those who love the Lord, everything helps them. And it makes a comma, and it says, this is for those who, according to his purpose, have been called. Maybe God has the calling of a pastor, an evangelist, prophet. He's going to form you through what you're living through at home. I can speak to you and I can say that if there's someone who doesn't pay attention to you, doesn't respect you at home, what if God is preparing for the place that he's taking you? People are going to reject you. People are going to do so many things to you. Be on wait for the Holy Spirit. Is that not what the Bible says? If the Bible, ever since I saw that verse, and it took it, from there, God started to help me to let go of the pain, of the rejection that I felt, to let go of all of these things because it says, I am preparing you for what I have in your life. If you would have found me raw and immature, I probably would have dragged a few of you, a few people. Before I give me anger, now I feel compassion, sorry. I was taught how to give a, a say an old school slap, right? Country style. 
when you slap someone and it stays marked for a long time, I used to say that it was a blessing for my sister to teach me, but no. Because when I did some, I did slap someone, I regretted doing it. And in the third year, the occasion slapped him. If they wouldn't have had removed that young girl, I would have killed her from you. She followed me the first year of school, second year of school, followed me the third year of school, and before leaving school, I said, you, you got me fed up. I hit her onto the cement. And you know that the teacher knew that she provoked me to great extent because they didn't even tell my mom. I was like a little cat. You know, I knew that if somebody hit me, my mom was going to hit me even more. I said, so I'm going to let some... My mom, I'm sorry, someone hit me once, but not twice, right? Not my mom. Am I showing off? No, I'm saying that Christ does changes in us. If I did not experience this, I would not ever speak about Jesus because he has been my hope in stubbornness, in my tantrums and everything where I have locked in and wanting to be a victim it has been him. If not, I would be complete garbage because I'm not proud of that. My sister were always, were always fast and pray a lot. I always remember the story of the gathering that's who I feel most close, similar to in the Bible. Those of you know, much prayer and fasting were my sister and when I was saved, the one who was sitting with so, so close to me, she was so afraid of me, she told me, because your, your, your sight, it was like a demon-possessed person when you would get so angry with me, and I was so ashamed. I don't show these things off, I use them for the glory of God, because I have nothing to be glorious about, I have nothing to glory about in the flesh, because it's taken me to do such horrible, despicable things before God. I'm not happy of any of those things. If my sister would have told me that when I served the devil and there were demons in me, maybe it would have went really bad for her. Look, people, I wanted to just undo them. And somebody told me that that the devil wanted to use me so much more I took care of my salvation your way of speaking and I tell you before God I'm saying this so no one will be afraid no when God purifies and sanctifies he takes you to a place for me to lower myself with someone who wants to fight with me that's to lower my Christ because he's the one who's put me here. He's the one who helped me more. He elevated me more. I was telling my sister. My sister was telling me, I'm provoked. They're provoking me. I said, do not lower yourself because you have so much to lose. Everything you had advanced, everything you had cried because of your temperament, because of that that you struggle with, to once again go all the way to the, to the ground, to the floor again, don't allow that to happen. It's not easy because it's not easy to cultivate a beautiful tongue and an attractive tongue. I'm not going to say don't get ready. No, get ready. Look nice to the house of God. If the Holy Spirit touches you. Don't worry about all that stuff. But that's not what God is seeking. God wants you to have a sincere heart, a heart that's cleansed by his precious blood and for you and I to have a different speech. So I say, how do you speak to your husband? How do you speak to your wife? How do you speak to your children? Because sometimes they say, mom, mom, and you go, what? A kid comes from over here, from church, and you say, what's up, baby? The first word that appears in the mind of your child is hypocrite. Do they have the reason to think sí. that or not? Yes, they claro do. Sí. Of course they do. How can, how can you be sweet and then bitterness come from your mouth? It's not easy to cultivate a beautiful and attractive tongue. It's not easy. 
but we have a great help. Santiago 3, del 7 al 9 nos dice, James 3, 7 to 9. La nueva Biblia, and this is the New Living Translation. El ser humano puede domar People toda can tame clase all de kinds of animals, aves, birds, reptiles, reptiles and fish. Pero nadie puede but no one can lengua. tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Is the word of God clear? I'm speaking what the Bible says. The tongue is like uh, a horse. Has anyone ever seen them tame like a wild horse? <laughs> to be able to tie a wild horse, to be able to bring him to the ranch, right where we lived, iron, until that horse got tired. But as soon as the human would come close, I'm telling you this because it's telling us about the tongue. It's like a, a wild horse. When they think that they have it, tamed, dominated. Somebody tries to get on top of that horse, and sometimes it would throw them and go and try again. And so the horse was dominated. And sometimes it would trick you like it was being tamed, and then it would throw you really hard or kick you as hard. Its powerful energy breaks. They react in the same way. We're saying that the tongue is like a wild horse, right? Its energy breaks the tackles and its wild nature, apparently, when it's supposedly tamed, it starts to jump so high that the, 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 the trusting rider gets thrown over a, a tree and, it bite, and he bites the dust. How is it that we could put our tongue under control? How? How could it be tamed and educated to become beautiful, useful, and powerful? It's not about the way your body is. It's not about how big your muscles are. We're talking about men and women. It's not how big your legs have been developed because that's the pride of many people. Your tongue. The beauty that the Bible speaks of is in the tongue. We tell God who we are by our tongue. This powerful instrument speaking on the tongue can be beautiful and useful, bringing it under a greater power than itself, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you and I do not depend on God, believe me that it's going to play such tremendous games with us, it's the Holy Spirit that can transform. Because look at what he said. God gives a recommendation when he's going to go. And he says, in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. The house. First the house. First starts in the house. Jerusalem was the home. Their place. And in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, when we shine at home, we will be able to shine wherever God places us, whether it be Paris, Africa, for those who want to go over there. But look at what we're going to see. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were all with one accord in one place. The gossipers had left. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as the fire, 
and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why do you think Peter already had the, the form of a child of God, his son, but there was still immaturity because he didn't want to be recognized that he was one of them, but one of them says, no, you are one of them because your speech deceives you, betrays you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, betrays you. And you see Peter, when he goes by, this always gets my attention because Jesus said, one of you is going to deny me three times. He said, no, Lord, Sandra, no, they may all deny you, but not me, not me. Who, me? Not me. And he was the first one, right? Oh, Peter, you could say. The devil has asked for your soul to sift you. But let me tell you, after the Holy Spirit appears, this is where it says very clearly, there was divided tongues. Come on, the tongue. When he gets up, when there's all these questions and all these people are trying to figure out what was going on, they were drunk or what had happened, Peter gets up, but when he stands up, now he starts to speak to the rest of the apostles to stand with him. Now he wasn't going to take the glory. Look at the difference. When the Spirit comes and descends over our time, it's because I pray. It's because because of me. Look, brother, it's not that. It's because him, us being miserable civilians, he has been merciful and great, and there's nothing else but that. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, there was the first figure in which it was manifested was in the figure of the tongue. Dividing tongues, it said. And the first instruments that were used, that God uses after they were the Holy Spirit, the tongues of the apostles, the disciples started to speak in tongues. And not just in tongues, it says that the first message was Peter. What happened? Many souls came. It was in some 5,000, in some 3,000. That was after the Lord started to work in his tongue, in their tongues. He himself enjoyed this after having cursed and swearing that he wasn't with them. And he knew that he was not to swear either. He got up and said this beautiful sermon. The first time, 3,000 3, souls. Sorry. The second time, 5,000. Sometimes I say that congregations have a broken net. The souls come, and the same people here, that hole that they have, that's where the souls escape from. Those are the ones that harm. First Corinthians 12.3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, by the tongue. If he has it controlled, and I'm about to finish, it's the Holy Spirit, church, congregation. If you have tried to change, if that's where you're, you're wrong. You have to allow Jesus Christ, you have to allow him to put you in the waters, to float on those waters, so that he can take you where he wants to take you. Because if we still fight, then we're not going to get anywhere. It's the Holy Spirit who transforms the cursing tongue into a testifying tongue. There is no one else. It's the Holy Spirit, the only one who can do these things. And the conclusion, 
Is this, we're still going to talk more. The next one is a beautiful tongue is a silent tongue. The conclusion is this. Your tongue cannot be made beautiful just by your own efforts. Requires the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. I was never able to. I never could alone. And this is not to say that your own efforts are not necessary. God has given you a mind and a will, and he waits for you to use them. He wants you to take on your responsibilities over the beautiful instruments that he has given you. He has revealed to us a richness of information and advice when it comes to how we should use our tongue. And he awaits for you to put it to practice. Exercises of beauty. Do you want a beautiful tongue? Start leaving laziness to the side. It's time. Right now. Right now to put this to the side. You have to pay attention. And the first part for these exercises, these beauty exercises for the tongue, is to memorize biblical verses at least four days out of the week. We can use them like help. Many people say, as the psalmist said, Psalm 119.11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the only verse they know. Your, your tongue. Why do you think the psalmist expressed his own sanctification came on behalf of God? He made him hate and separate from all of that that did not please God, from all of that that corrupted him, from all of that that did not allow him to get closer to God. That's why he expressed this. How can you do work for your tongue if you can't even put in the effort to learn verses? Study carefully the chapters 3 and 4 of James that talks to us about the tongue. This is the most substantial part of the Bible that talks specifically about the tongue. Third, re-examine your concept of beauty. What interests you more? Internal or external beauty? What kind of beauty is more important to the eyes of the people that you know for them to respect you? Did you know that many people don't respect you because they know your tongue? They don't respect you as a Christian. Why? You could be really nice and your muscles, your body. You could even go to some pageant or competition. That's not what God seeks at all. You think God wants you to go and remove your cellulite and all that kind of stuff when your tongue is separated from reason? reason as in the word of God? No. No. What is it? For including your prayers and your sincere petitions in favor of the tongue that is inside your mouth, not your husband's or your wife's. That is their own responsibility, not in the child, in your children. That's their responsibility. Your own Tongue, your own mouth. Recognize that it's the Holy Spirit that can give you discipline and power. Start to submit your tongue to the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to the last. Prophylactic chewing gum for the tongue. Don't be afraid. I'm going to pray. Prophylactic is part of medicine that is needed for conservation of health. You want a good tongue, you need to maintain it. 
para que sea be, saludable. So that it could be healthy. Y la Biblia es la mejor. And the Bible is the best Ahora, medicine. Cuando a veces sabemos que traemos so mal aliento. So sometimes when we know that we have bad breath. O mal olor en la boca. Bad breath. Están los chiclecitos de menta. We got mint gum. Están los de estas de, de canela, de Cinnamon hierbabuena. Mint. Y no la metemos. Escogí una pastilla para masticarla durante todo el día. Se las voy a dar, mi hermano. Pick one of these to chew all day we're in the beauty shop remember Lunes. on Monday James 3.5 it's for Monday memorize this or learn it even so the tongue is a little pequeño, member and boasts great things cosas. Aquí, see how great a forest a little fire kindles When you want to get angry, believe me, this is going to help you. This is the word of God. Tuesday. These are the, the mints you need for that bad odor before the presence of God. James 3.2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to brittle the whole body. Wednesday. This is your Wednesday mint. This is Proverbs 18:21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Learn that we are in the hands of God, and everything that comes into our life, He is preparing it. God is making us capable for what we're going to do for God, and it's going to be useful to us like you have no idea. Thursday, mint. Songs of Solomon. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. That is the beauty that God wants. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. The veil, the little red cheeks. That sometimes people are, you know, a lot of blush. <laughs> to, to make them look so brothers we got our homework and then we'll continue on if God gives us life when it's my turn to preach again a beautiful tongue is a silent tongue Here. the altar is open do what is correct Agradeciendo que eres especial, que eres maravilloso. Agradeciéndote, mi Dios, por todo. Padre, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús, que sea tu mano poderosa, que sea tu mano gloriosa, que sea tu Espíritu Santo, Señor, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Por favor, Señor, ayúdanos en todo lo que se está cocinando en la olla, mi Señor, ayúdanos. En el nombre de Jesús, en todo, Señor. Yo sé que saliendo de aquí, Señor, cada uno de mis hermanos va 